If you recall, we're working on this new problem. Find the area under a curve and above an interval. Find the area under a curve and above an interval. The idea, the tool that we have is just the idea behind area itself. Area is equal to length times width. We know that area is equal to length times width. We think of that as the area of a rectangle. That is just the very thought of what area is, length times width. It works on rectangles because in a rectangle, the length is constant over the entire width. But our problem has the area under a curve. The problem that we face is not only is the length variable, but the length is continuously variable. That's the problem that we needed to address. We need to address the fact that we want to multiply length times width, but length is continuously variable. So the things that we have to do, have to deal with here, we had to think about the thinking. We had to think about the thinking. We had to think about some mechanics. How are we going to make this work? And then we have to think about some applications. We got to think about why we're going to do this. So there's the thinking, there's the mechanics, there's the application. Always in math, these are the things that we need to deal with. How are we going to think about the problem? How are we going to um, deal with the problem? Like by pushing symbols around the page. And when is this a, a, an important question? So yesterday we dealt with the fact that the length is continuously variable by making the length constant on sub intervals. So our thinking was we make the length constant on sub intervals. Thinking, make the length constant in small bits. Yesterday, this is what we dealt with, the thinking about finding the area under a curve and above an interval. We did this by making the length constant for small changes in x. The reason that this works is that we get a bunch of rectangles that we can add together the areas. So this creates a bunch of rectangles. We can use length times width to find the area of those rectangles and then just add those rectangles to the areas of those rectangles together. So making the length constant for small changes in X makes rectangles. Then we can do area is equal to length times width. And then we just add up the areas. So rather than viewing our function as being continuously variable, rather than making our function continuously variable, oops. We divided the interval, the interval on the bottom, into sub-intervals. On the space. We divided the interval into sub-intervals, each one with delta x.
Then for the length, we evaluated the function at three different points in those subintervals. We wanted to do length times width, but the length was continuously variable, not just variable, continuously variable. So we took care of that continuous part by making it constant for a bunch of different values. Flatten out. And then we just get three rectangles Find the area of each of the rectangles, add them up. We introduced summation notation. We introduced this capital sigma notation, which says the sum as i goes from one to three of f of et, f at x i delta x. Calculate f at x i delta x for all the values of i in the index. I is our index. We just have I be one, two, and three. Write F at X I for one, two, and three. And then we can sum it, write, write this sum. We do this because all of the terms have the same format. F at something times delta X. And we're doing this over a discrete set. In this case, we have a discrete model for a continuous, for our continuous change. So another thing we want to note here is that this is a discrete model for continuous change. We're creating a discrete model for continuous change. Rather than flowing from one to the next, we're just marking off a bunch of different heights. This gave us an approximation of the area. We could see there's a little bit of overestimate and a little bit of underestimate in each of these rectangles. So using more rectangles gave us a better approximation. So using infinitely many rectangles is what we want. So more rectangle, improve approximation with more rectangles. And then we do the calculus thing, use infinitely many rectangles. At this point, you're thinking, dude, didn't you say all this stuff yesterday? It's like, oh, yeah, but I took longer to do it. And songs don't get stuck in your head because you hear them once. Songs get stuck in your head because you can't escape them.
trying to get this on the radio. I used to get this on the radio, but it doesn't matter anymore because we don't listen to the radio anymore. Just turn on your FM dial. Wild 94.9. Don't forget, a discrete model for continuous change to find the area under the curve. Well, what, did, that think, did they just talk about math? And then they just play a song and distract you from that. DJ comes back on. Remember, you can improve your approximation with more rectangles. And then what does calculus say? And then they make a sound effect. Wah, wah. Use infinitely many rectangles. And now the latest song from popular music artists. I, I don't know any popular music artists. Aside from the ones you can't like escape, right? So I know who Taylor Swift is. I know who Beyonce is. I know about 10 seconds of Beyonce's latest song. As far as I know, that song only 10 seconds long. It's not like I'm actively avoiding Taylor Swift and Beyonce's music. It's just that it's like not in the circle where I normally hang out. You know what I mean? And it's just like most people aren't familiar with finding the area under a curve and above an interval. Right. So what we did was we're gonna calculate an area as length times width. So we're gonna take length times a piece of the interval, let's say delta x. This is a width. F at xi is our discrete model of continuous length. So this F at X I delta X is an area. Area is equal to length times width. We're doing this a bunch of times and adding the results. We add the results. So here we say add the results. This says find the areas of N rectangles and add the results. So the sum is I goes from one to N. So we're using N rectangles. And then calculus says use infinitely many rectangles to get the exact value. And so we get this expression, limit as n goes to infinity of the sum as i goes from one to n of f at x i delta x. Remember where this comes from. This comes from just length times width. The problem that we're trying to solve is that the length was continuously variable. So we created a discrete model of this continuously variable length to find the area of a bunch of rectangles. And then we just added up the areas of the rectangles. And then calculus says, use infinitely many rectangles. Now, this is not mechanically practical. Even though we're just evaluating the function a bunch of times, that could be mechanically cumbersome. Even though it's just multiplication and addition, that might become mechanically cumbersome. So. We need a way to evaluate this Riemann sum. 
This is a Riemann sum. This is the thinking behind this area under the curve problem. We need to get into some mechanics behind the area under the curve problem. This notation that uh, it's kind of it's not really a capital X, it's kind of like a very tall stretched out S. So make an S and then grab the top and bottom and kind of pull on it a little bit. So it's like a taller and thinner S. Then it has a subscript of A and a superscript of B, and then we just write f of x dx. This is the definite integral. It's a definite integral from A to B of f of x dx. That's how we would say this symbol. That's how we would read this symbol. The definite integral from A to B of f of x dx. Here's what we write, definite integral from a to b of f of x dx. What we say, the definite integral of f, uh, from a to b of f of x dx. What we mean is evaluate the expression f of x dx at all the points on the integral from a to b. Evaluate the expression f of x dx for all x from a to b, then add the results. Now, if that sounds fishy to you, it is super fishy, but that's what we're thinking of. So evaluate this expression, f of x dx, at all values of x, from A to B, then add the results. That's what this symbol is asking you to do. We're just gonna evaluate this expression at all the points from A to B and add the results. This should sound very fishy. Let me explain why this sounds very fishy. The interval from A to B is a continuum. There is no next real number. It's a continuum of numbers. Where do we put the plus signs in a continuum? That's the problem that we run into. So if you're looking at this and saying, Leach, this sounds super fishy that you're asking us to do this. I'm not sure why. That's why. The interval from A to B is a continuum. When you say all the values of X, how do we make a list of all the values of X? We can't make a list in a continuum. There's nowhere to put the plus signs.
the interval from A to B is a continuum. There's no next real number. There's nowhere to put the plus signs because we're, remember what we're doing is we're modeling a continuum with a discrete set. That's okay. This is just how we think about things. The point is that we're thinking about it. It's like the trolley problem. You're not supposed to answer the trolley problem. It's just supposed to make you think about things. If you think you have an answer to the trolley problem, that means you didn't really understand the point of the trolley problem. You're just supposed to be thinking about it. You know what I mean? Does everybody know what the trolley problem is? So there's five people on the tracks and a trolley will run them over. They're tied to the tracks. So you can't like save them that way. Then on a separate track, there's one person tied to the tracks. If you pull the switch, then the trolley will not run over the five people, but it will definitely run over the one person. But you have to act. If you do nothing, five people get run over. If you act and pull the switch, one person gets run over, five people don't. But your actions cause that one person to die. So what is the moral, ethical, reasonable, logical thing to do? And if you're like, oh, I pull the switch and quickly untie the person that's the one person tied to the track because I'm built different, you don't understand the point of the question. Do you know what I mean? That's what thought experiments are about. It's not about coming up with some sneaky solution. We're not playing D&D &D here. It's just the way we're thinking about it. This definite integral from A to B of f of x dx, this is a, a representation of a continuous sum. This is a representation of a continuous sum. This is just notation. But we want to be able to read what the notation is trying to tell us. This definite integral comes from the Riemann sum, which is us making a discrete model of our continuous thing. This is just what happens when we do infinite rectangles and we have our continuous sum. If you go ask Dr. Google what's a continuous sum, you probably won't get any results. This is just local language that I like to encourage you to think about what this definite interval represents. How's everybody okay? Here's the interesting part. You won't think it's interesting. I, it, clearly, you're not going to natively think it's interesting because I'm telling you that it's the interesting part. I have to be like, oh, here's the interesting part. It's like when the, in a movie, they have to play sad music. So you're like, oh, what's going on? Oh, the music says I'm supposed to feel sad. So, oh, I'm sad, right? Because the, 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 the filmmaker is like, oh, well, I can't just have the scene be on its own. People won't understand what's going on. Or like if we're at a sports event and something happens that isn't a home run, but is still pretty exciting, they have to tell you. It's like, oh, that was exciting. And the scoreboard goes, wow. And you're like, oh, I guess, I guess that was impressive. Even though the ball didn't go far over the wall, that was still, that must have been something cool. You know what I mean? I don't know if they do that anymore. I haven't been to a sporting event for a very long time. Last time I was at a sporting event. No, no, I've been to Pactel Park. I still call it Pactel Park. Tells you how long it's been since I've been there for. What are we talking about? Oh, yes. This is not mechanically feasible, right? Because there's nowhere to put the plus signs. So, fortunately for us, we have this bit of mechanics. The definite integral from A to B of f of x dx is capital F at B minus capital F at A, where capital F 
is an antiderivative of f. The definite integral from a to b of f of x to x is capital F at b minus capital F at a, where capital F is an antiderivative of little f. Now we've tied this area problem to something that we kind of know how to do. We know how to do derivatives. Antiderivatives is going the other direction. Instead of saying the derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus 1, the antiderivative of nx to the n minus 1 is x to the n. This is all the stuff that we've been working on. Do that backwards. This is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The definite integral from a to b of f of x dx is capital F at b minus capital F at a, where f is an antiderivative, or capital F is an antiderivative of f. That is, capital F prime is f of x. And the mechanics emerge. The mechanics that we need to learn now are all our derivative stuff backwards. So there's our new mechanics. Any questions? So it's derivatives, but Jeopardy style. Instead of saying, here's a function, what's the derivative? Here's a function, what is this the derivative of? Is everybody okay? I'm pausing for copying. I'm also leaving this up with the Riemann sum and the definite integral and the capital F at B minus capital F at A. I can't remember if anybody here writes in all caps. That's a thing that's kind of going away. If you write in all caps, you are incorrect. Stop shouting. Calm down. Don't write in all caps. That's kind of gone away. It used to be more common. Like it'd be really weird if you find a young person that writes in all caps because that's shouting when you're texting, right? I saw a person complaining about uh, people being offended by punctuation in text messages. And unsurprisingly, this was an old person. It's like, oh, are you offended by a proper punctuation? It's like, oh, no. Putting a period at the end of your text means something now. The fact that you don't see it just means you're old. But the people grew up that grew up texting each other read it differently. Alternate capital letters. Uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase. That reads differently than just writing stuff.
here's one of the things that we have to do. So the question that we have now is that we're looking at 2x and we're not saying the derivative of 2x is 2. We're saying, what is 2x the derivative of? And I always pick this one because it's pretty easy to spot. What is 2x the derivative of? So lowercase f is 2x. Uppercase f we're going to use for an antiderivative. Not real good. What is 2x the derivative of? We got 2x. We had a function. We multiplied by the exponent. Then we subtracted 1 from the exponent. So we should just get 1x squared. Let's check that makes, makes that works, right? The derivative of x squared is 2x to the 1. So 2x is a derivative, is the derivative of x squared. Is this the only capital F of x? Clearly the answer is no, otherwise I wouldn't have bothered asking the question, right? Sometimes from the tone of my voice, you could tell the answer is no. What else is an antiderivative of 2x? I have x squared plus 1, the derivative is 2x, and then the derivative of the plus 1, the constant term, is 0. The derivative of x squared minus 1 is 2x plus 0, so just the 2x. This can go on forever. What we find is that antiderivatives are not unique. We have an infinite number of antiderivatives of a function. That's why I said find an antiderivative of f of x equals 2x. That's why in our fundamental theorem of calculus, we said capital F is an antiderivative of f. An antiderivative. Ooh, I'm kind of Blair Witch, you all. Give you motion sickness. And this is why, because the derivative of every constant is equal to zero. So we don't, we can't know precisely what function, where this two x came from. Fortunately, for the fundamental theorem of calculus, we just need an antiderivative. So. Let's see this antiderivative in play in a definite integral. Let's suppose I wanted to calculate the definite integral from 0 to 3 of 2x dx. The definite integral from 0 to 3 of 2x dx is going to be the ant and antiderivative of 2x. We're going to use x squared plus 0, so just x squared, evaluated from 0 to 3. Here's how we're going to write it. We're going to find the antiderivative of 2x. That's x squared, or an antiderivative. And then I need to evaluate from 0 to 3. So put a vertical line at the end and plug a zero and a three. So 
So the definite integral from zero to three of two x dx is x squared evaluated from zero to three. So we can read this as x squared And what that means is what we have in the fundamental theorem of calculus. Plug in three, plug in zero, and subtract. So take the three and square it. Take the zero and square it. And subtract. So that vertical bar is how we say evaluate at these values and subtract. It used to work like one of the old credit card machines where they actually had to take impressions of your card. So the reason that your card has all the, has like some of your credit cards have raised numbers on them is that we used to have to make carbon copies. So you put, you, put the card in the machine and put like carbon paper on top of it and like run this thing over it and take an impression. Now, I don't know why we still have the raised numbers. Some cards don't. Because some banks have said, it's like, oh, why are you keep raising these stupid numbers? Let's just print them on them. Now we don't even carry credit cards anymore. Throw our phone out. Let's think about what this problem, what this definite integral represents. It represents the area under the curve 2x between 0 and 3. So the curve 2x is just a line with a slope of 2 through the origin. Above the interval from 0 to 3. And we are trying to find the area. But since 2x is just a line, this region is just a triangle. With a height of 6 and a base of 3. So the area. is one half the base times the height this is why i picked this one pick something that we can just solve with geometry make sure that our new thing fits How's everybody okay? Whenever you learn a thing in math, you have to learn it backwards and forwards. We learn how to find derivatives. Now we have to learn how to unfind derivatives. So you have to learn that backwards. That's going to be our new game, finding anti-derivatives. Questions? Comments? A definite integral has an interval, integral from 0 to 3, the definite integral from 0 to 3 of 2x dx. If we leave off the interval, we can write an indefinite integral.
An indefinite integral leaves off the interval. So we just write, might write the indefinite integral So instead of the integral from zero to three or the integral from A to B, we just say the integral of two X dx. This is an indefinite integral. And we often use this as instructions for find the antiderivative. So indefinite integral can be interpreted as find the antiderivative. I just started using the article the instead of an because I'm going to throw in a word after the. So this is you, we can you interpret the indefinite integral as instructions for finding the general antiderivative. The general part of the antiderivative is where we address that constant term. The antiderivative of 2x is x squared plus some constant what we don't know anything about. So we write plus C, that's a constant of integration. It shows up when we find an antiderivative because the derivative of all constants is equal to zero. So taking the derivative, we lose some information. In the previous example, we chose the antiderivative that has a constant of zero. Because if we're doing a definite integral, it's going to cancel out anyway. If I had plus x squared plus 5, I'd have 3 squared plus 5 minus 0 squared plus 5. The 5s would cancel out. So let's pick the easiest constant. It's not supposed to be a dot above the x. How's that okay? Then, of course, we got to talk about what all this means, what applications there are of this particular process. All right, that's going to do it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day, and thanks for playing.